Welcome to my talk on Hypatia, a simulation framework for low Earth orbit satellite networks. It facilitates network research in a field still in its infancy, yet a field which promises to revolutionize the internet. I will first start with an introduction into low Earth orbit satellite networks and then dive into how Hypatia works and its research value. Let me start by touching upon three fantastic recent advances in space technology. Reusable boosters, which come back to Earth after launching rockets, thus reducing launch costs. Significant reduction in size and weight of satellites, thereby packing more satellites per launch, reducing costs. And automated link tracking, which enables inter-satellite laser communication. Products offering laser inter-satellite connectivity at 10 to 20G at distances up to 8,000 kilometers are already available. But what are all these developments leading up to? The primary goal, it seems, is to build mega constellations consisting of thousands of low-flying satellites, which provide global low-latency internet coverage. Constellations consist of multiple low Earth orbit or LEO shells of satellites, which vary in height and inclination. And within each shell, there are multiple orbits and satellites per orbit. Here, you can see three largest planned LEO satellite networks. SpaceX Starlink Phase 1, consisting of five shells with a total of 4,409 satellites. Amazon Squeeper, consisting of three shells with a total of 3,236 satellites. And finally, Telesat, consisting of two shells with a total of 1,671 satellites. Let us see some of their interesting features. To start with, let us compare GEO and LEO satellite heights. A geosynchronous or GEO satellite has a height of 36,000 kilometers and the minimum round trip times or RTTs are nearly 240 milliseconds. Low Earth orbit or LEO satellites on the other hand fly at heights between 300 and 2,000 kilometers, thus reducing RTTs by more than 60x. Let us briefly touch upon the connectivity in these LEO networks. Let S and T be the source and target ground stations or GSS respectively. Each satellite uses radio up or down links to communicate with ground stations. A satellite can only connect to GSS from which it can be seen at sufficiently high elevation in the sky as defined by the minimum angle of elevation. Each satellite will have multiple antennas with each antenna supporting multiple steerable beams. The beam steering and frequency band allocation will be software defined with the goal of minimizing interference and maximizing throughput. Satellites also connect to each other using laser inter-satellite links or ISLs. An end-to-end -end path between two GSS comprises a radio uplink from the source S to the ingress satellite, followed by zero or more laser ISLs, and then the egress radio downlink to the target T. Another interesting aspect is the system dynamics of these constellations. Satellites move very fast relative to the Earth and with respect to each other. If a satellite is now over eastern Brazil, in six minutes, it will already reach Africa, crossing the entire Atlantic, traveling more than eight kilometers per second. Such highly dynamic behavior translates to links becoming invisible in minutes and link latencies changing all the time, irrespective of the queuing. We'll see, see later how this dynamicity influences TCP behavior. Having covered the basics, let us see where current developments stand. All information on LEO satellite networks are available only as FCC or ITU filings. While some of these networks are already under heavy deployment, networking problems like topology design, routing, and congestion control are yet to be addressed given the high dynamicity of these networks. Unfortunately, there is no packet level simulator to deep dive into such research. SNS3 or Satellite Network Simulator is the nearest competitor but it addresses geocommunications, which is much simpler due to the stationarity of geosatellites relative to the Earth. It also works at a scale multiple orders of magnitude smaller than LEO networks. To address the urgent need for tools that enable research on LEO networks, we built Hypatia. Hypatia provides a packet level simulator built on top of NS3 that incorporates LEO dynamics. It takes into account satellite trajectories, coverage constraints for GS satellite connectivity, and the structure of inter-satellite connectivity. It can be used to implement and evaluate novel ideas 
for satellite trajectory design, inter-satellite topology, routing, and congestion control. It also includes a visualization module to aid intuition. The visualization component uses cesium to render views of the trajectories, GS perspective on overhead satellites, end-to-end -end routes, evolving link utilization, and available bandwidth on routes. Hypatia takes as input the satellite orbital elements, inter-satellite topology, and ground station locations. It pre-calculates dynamic states like routing doubles at a fixed time step interval such that subsequent simulations incur this cost only once. Packet level simulations can be run to analyze various network behavior, including TCP dynamics. One can use all the legacy of NST tools they want. Link properties are updated in a lazy fashion before a packet is sent. Hypatia allows the production of visualizations using cesium, such as the one you can see on the right, showing link utilization for a traffic matrix. In a nutshell, Hypatia is a framework for simulating and visualizing large geo networks, thus enabling research on these networks. In this paper, we do not solve the topology design, routing, or transport problems that arise due to the high dynamicity of these networks. Rather, we demonstrate Hypatia's utility in understanding the behavior of such networks, especially the temporal variations in the structure of paths and their latencies. We draw out some of the implications of this LEO network dynamism for congestion control and routing and traffic engineering. Before diving into the results, let us touch upon the experimental setup. We simulate either the first shell of Kuiper, Starlink, or Telesat. The intersatellite connectivity is a plus grid, which is a north-south-east-west connectivity pattern. To the best of our knowledge, all publicly available scientific papers, patents, and visualizations assume the same plus grid connectivity. For ground station locations, we select the top 100 most populated cities by 2025. The intervals at which the dynamic states are calculated are 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, and one second. And the paper has a comparison among the three. 100 millisecond, which is reasonably accurate, is used here as the default. The bandwidth is set to 10 megabit per second for both the ground satellite and the inter-satellite network devices. Let us now look at some of our results. To start with, let us look at how the end-to-end -end RTTs vary over time. These experiments use the Kuiper K1 shell, which consists of 34 orbits, 34 satellites per orbit, and operate at a height of 630 kilometer and an inclination of 51.9 degrees. We examine the end-to-end -end path from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil to St. Petersburg in Russia. First, using network X in Python, we examine how the end-to-end -end RTTs vary over time between these two locations. Along x-axis, we have elapsed time, while y-axis shows the RTTs. Note, at t equals 33 seconds, the path changes, which causes the RTT to rise from 96 milliseconds to 111 milliseconds. There are multiple such path changes as seen in the plot. Also, the path sees a disruption around 160 seconds, shown as the shaded region in the plot. We found that for this period, St. Petersburg does not have any visible Kuiper satellite at sufficiently high angles of elevation, which obviously results in the satellite network path being disconnected. As a verification step, when we run pings every one millisecond over an empty network in NS3, these match up. Finally, in NS3, we can also run a TCP new Reno flow between the two locations, which was otherwise impossible with network X. Because of changing queuing delay, TCP RTTs fluctuate over time, which is evident from the plot. We now explore how congestion control works on changing satellite paths. For now, we use a congestion-free setting. The measured end-to-end -end connection is the only one sending traffic, with the rest of the network being entirely empty. Let us look at the TCP congestion window in order to understand how TCP reacts to non-congestion changes in these networks. On the x-axis, we have elapsed time again, while y-axis now shows the number of packets. The instantaneous BDP aggregated with Q capacity, that is BDP plus Q, is shown at each point in time. This is the maximum number of packets that can be in flight without drops, assuming there is one bottleneck. 
the network device queue size for both ISLs and GSLs is set to 100 packets. For the times when BDP plus Q is stable, TCP, as expected, repeatedly hits it, incurs a drop, cuts the rate, and ramps up again. The disconnection even for St. Petersburg is evident in the plot. This disconnection, although highly predictable due to predictable satellite motions, influences TCP behavior. The paper has additional experiments which show that TCP drops congestion window also because of path changes and consequent reordering of packets. Note that path changes are predictable in satellite networks. Now, let us compare how loss-based and delay-based congestion control schemes react to network changes. For this, we look at achieve rate over time, which is the achieved throughput averaged over 100 millisecond intervals. The y-axis here represents this rate. TCP New Reno achieves fairly good rate over time, with a large fraction of the entire period seeing rate equivalent to bandwidth. However, for TCP Vegas, a delay-based congestion control protocol, the story is slightly different. It considers the low RTT at the beginning to be the base RTT, causing it for the remainder of the connection to always want to reduce its rate due to the higher RTTs being observed. The takeaway is that both loss and delay-based congestion control schemes can be affected due to the continuous path latency changes and reordering of packets in the network happening not due to congestion, but predictable path changes over time. Note that the interesting interplay of TCP dynamics and satellite trajectory dynamics is one of the key reasons why we built Hypatia, a packet level simulator rather than a flow level simulator. Now we go into a constellation wide analysis for the first shells of the three largest planned constellations, Starlink, Kuiper, and Telesat. To start with, we compared how the three constellations fare in terms of RTTs over shortest paths, RTT variations over time, and path change frequency. We now have an ECDF over all city pairs, and we plot the maximum RTT over time per city pair along shortest paths. Telesat has the fewest satellites with less than a third of Kuipers and less than a fourth of Starlings, and yet it achieves the lowest latencies for most connections. Telesat claims that it will use a much lower minimum angle of elevation, 10 degrees, compared to Starlink's 25 degrees and Kuiper's 30 degrees. This allows GSS to see more of Telesat satellites at any time, providing more options for end-to-end -end paths. Additionally, as these low elevation paths are closer to the horizon, the overhead of the up-down link is often smaller. Telesat RTTs are closely followed by Kuiper RTTs. However, Starlink has the highest RTTs among the three. The Starlink Kuiper differences are not due to the angle of elevation, which is similar, but the orbital structure. Kuiper's orbital design with 34 orbits of 34 satellites each is more uniform than Starlink's, with 72 orbits of 22 satellites each. In particular, satellites within an orbit are much further apart in Starlink, and paths often require zigzagging through multiple orbits to reach the destination. Here is some further explanation on this. The blue dashed line shows the path between Brasilia and Luanda using a constellation which has many orbits and fewer satellites per orbit, like Starlink's first shell consisting of 72 orbits and 22 satellites per orbit, thus resulting in higher RTTs due to the zigzag pattern, which is an artifact of plus grid connectivity. The yellow line shows a path using a constellation built with the same number of satellites, but having fewer orbits and more satellites per orbit. This path has lower RTT. Coming back to the plot, for all three constellations, more than 80% of connections see a maximum RTT less than two times the geodesic. Given that terrestrial fiber paths are often long-winded, and the speed of light in fiber is roughly two-thirds the speed of light in air, this implies that for most connections in our simulation, LEO networks will have substantially lower latencies than today's internet. Next, we look at the ECDF of maximum RTTs divided by the minimum RTTs in order to understand the variation of RTTs over time across city pairs. The results show that while Starlink sees the largest latency changes, the other constellations also feature significant latency variation at the tail. Telesat's variations are smallest again because of its low inclination. The same satellites are reachable for longer and result in more continuous and smaller latency changes. 
Now, let us analyze how frequently end-to-end -end paths change in constellations. Remember that such path changes might trigger reordering of packets, thus affecting congestion control. In the median, over the 200 second simulation, Starlink and Kuiper connections see four path changes, while Telesat connections see two changes. These results are in line with our explanation of RTT variations. Telesat's use of a lower minimum angle of elevation allows ground stations to remain connected to a satellite for longer and reduces path changes. For two reasons, we caution against concluding that Telesat is a better design. Number one, there are downsides to using a lower minimum angle of elevation. And number two, we are evaluating constellations strictly from their filings, and it is unclear to us if some operators are more optimistic than others about the plausible design parameters. The filings are meant to secure radio spectrum for an operator by showing the potential utility of its network. The larger point, as far as the Hypatia framework is concerned, is that given the right input parameters, we can compare different designs along metrics like RTTs and RTT variability. Besides the structure and latency of paths and the response of individual TCP connections, we would also like to understand the result of interactions between traffic flows in such networks. Towards this goal, we conduct a simple experiment, sending long-running TCP flows between pairs of GSs over their shortest paths. Each link in the network is set to 10 megabit per second, and we send long-running TCP new Reno flows between a random permutation of GS pairs. We focus on the Rio to St. Petersburg path and make sure not to make the first or last hop the bottleneck so that we can focus on the ISL network's behavior. Y-axis represents the unused bandwidth, which is the path's link capacity minus the utilization of the most congested on-path link at any time. In a static network with fixed routing and a fixed set of long-running TCP flows, we should expect this unused bandwidth to be small. This static network TCP behavior is shown as the gray line in the plot for the topology frozen at its t equals zero position. However, we find that in a dynamic LEO network with cross traffic, the amount of unused bandwidth is larger than that in the static case. The reason for this difference is the shifts in cross traffic resulting from the path changes. Links constituting a GS pair's shortest path change over time, and for each link, the set of GS pairs it is used for changes as well. This implies that the traffic mix at any link is highly dynamic, making it difficult for transport to adapt. The takeaway is that LEO networks present new routing, TE, and transport challenges. Routing and traffic engineering could be planned ahead, such that knowing the upcoming changes in paths, traffic can be shifted a priori from links that will become new bottlenecks soon. Talking about the future work, we plan to incorporate different interference avoiding strategies mentioned in the FCC or ITU filings. SpaceX and Kuiper, for example, have different strategies. Various constellations are being proposed regularly, so it is important to provide continued support in adding new constellations and traffic matrices. Hypatia currently supports shortest path routing, but there is no fundamental limitation in implementing other routing strategies. I hope this presentation has piqued your interest. If so, we would encourage you to read the full paper and explore the internet from space yourself with Hypatia by cloning our repo from GitHub.